I want to raise some issues about this myth of moral depravity, original sin, that seems to be so prevalent among the inability people. Even the people that have reject the idea of original sin, they still have a problem with uh, man's ability. You can reach me at my website at standingthegap.org or my Holding Firmly account on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and type in Holding Firmly, all one word. You get a good selection of my videos there. You can email me or also at my Holding Firmly at gmail.com. If you have any questions or concerns, you have plenty of PDFs. We've got books posted up there. Many, many help files to help you dig your way through this uh, massive deception that's in the world today. Let's jump right into this. I see moral depravity depicted in the scriptures as a progression that happens to mankind. Not that he's born in that state of moral depravity as though he's some kind of bad seed. Where they get this from, this bad seed idea, which was pretty prevalent among the reform preachers back in the, the, the so-called holiness preaching days and of course the Calvinist, which I don't waste any time refuting that nonsense because it's just total, total, complete uh, nonsense. But when they would use the passages in Job to get this idea that man is born of a bad seed. The reason for that bad seed, of course, was that the sin nature came from, passed down th through men, not the women. Uh, they get it from Job 14.4 and Job 15.14. Now, of course, it says in Job 1.1, when it introduces Job, that he was a blameless and upright man. Just like it talks about other people in the scriptures, like John the Baptist's parents in Luke chapter 1, they're called blameless and upright, walking in all the commandments of God, blameless. And Cornelius is called a, a righteous and devout man in Acts chapter 10. So we'll get into these things more. In Job 14.4, it says, uh, Who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? No one. And what is man that he could be pure? And then it's said in the other one in fifteen fourteen, and in he who is born a woman, you know who is he that could be righteous? Now they take these things as though and I know many of them old holiness sincere preachers really thought that that was God's word, but all you have to do is look in there. That's Job's friend saying that. It's not God saying these things. It's not. A, a doctrine that you can build something on, just like in the Psalms where they think that they find evidence for being conceived or born into sin. It's not something that God said. It, and in this case, of course, it's something that men said. So what do we have here? We have them crafting the scriptures to make it look like man's born in this condition, taking the consideration, of course, that that's really the basic condition of mankind. Certainly we could say that most people are born, most people are in some level of moral depravity, and because of this wretched man, chief of sinners teaching in the church, it would certainly appear that way, that they can't do anything right, that they cheat and they steal and they commit vile acts of perversion, they're drunkards and boasters and full of greed and pride and dispositions that aren't right in the sight of God. They sometimes resort to murder and crimes of, of, of molestations and rapes and, and all different kind of horrible things. Uh, generally lack self-control. They despise what is good. They're disobedient and rebellious, hard-headed, stiff-necked, the scriptures call it. You can hardly trust anyone to be faithful and honest to keep their word or not steal from you. Anybody that uh, employs people, understands that very clearly. It's very difficult to find someone to work for you that won't steal from you these days. And of course, this lays at the doorstep of this moral depravity, right at the doorstep of the so-called church that's been taught man that for so long. So it would certainly seem that the vast majority of people are in some kind of a reprobated state and then they say, of course, from birth, they, they're born dead in their sins, and they have no ability to do anything. They've got to be called by God. And, and, of course, you can take scriptures, like I said, and you can prove those things. You can, you can attempt to say, well, you know, no one comes to the Father except the Father calls him or draws him. But yet, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. See, there's always a contradiction to everything they say, just like their substitution and their, all the other things that they preach. Their versions of the atonement and, and their alternatives to repentance, all underscored, like I said, by this inability angle that's based on this moral depravity. 
you know, really what I just went over would pretty much describe the condition of the so-called professing Christians that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It would certainly seem that that's the condition of professed Christians in the church system for the most part, although not everybody's at the same level of reprob reprobation, but they certainly are described there in that passage very clearly. And again, all as a result of, of this. Now see, the, the thing is, is that the Jews taught very clearly that man was born with a moral conscience and natural inclinations. Here's as I show on my board. In other words, they were born, they were born in, with, with the light of God, like John 1, 9 says, the, the light that lights every man that comes into the world. What's that light? It's that light of moral conscience that's born into them. Just like the Gentiles knew what to do, what was right. Didn't have the law, but by nature do the things contained in the law. Well, what's the nature? The nature is the principle of growth. That's how the nature. Physis in the scriptures is translated nature in the English. Well, because it's the nature of growth as a scientific term, or the principle of growth. In other words, like long-practiced habit, you become, by tradition, like your fathers, like Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he talks about doing what's right and being judged according to your deeds. That's what's happening here. Because man's born in a state of moral conscience and natural inclinations. And as it shows in the Bible that infants, your young, your young ones who have no knowledge of right and wrong, like in Deuteronomy 139 for in particular, in many other places in the scriptures, showing that the, the infants, the young ones, have no knowledge of right and wrong. So they can't be judged. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, where he talks about, I was alive once without the law. In uh, verse 9 he says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin was revived and I died. Well, what's he mean? He means he was born in this state of, um, with a moral conscience and a natural inclinations. The natural inclination, inclinations and the desires. Meaning your, you know, your desire for rest, for relaxation, for food, for thirst, all those type of things for relationships, for marriage, for children, natural inclinations. They're not sinful in and of themselves. That's what this moral depravity thing has done to the minds of people. They think that that makes people sinful. Well, I'll show you here what I mean. So the Jews called this yes or to and yes or raw. You've probably heard me mention that if you watch my videos. Meaning, like I, I translate moral conscience and natural inclination, inclination. So Paul could not have taught this so-called original sin thing that they tag on him out of Romans chapter 5 and, and other scriptures in the New Testament. And then take a, a few select passages out of the Old Testament, as I showed you, and I'll show you some others, that they use, like the one in Job, to try to prove something that fits into their doctrines that they invented to begin with all based on this idea that man's got this corrupted nature. But no, man develops this corrupted nature by principle of growth, like we'll show in Romans chapter 1. But one other thing I think we should preface that with is the idea of what they've done to get this idea that man's natural inclinations are evil desires. So they kind of connect these two in their theology. They're saying that his natural inclinations to just to, to hunger, to thirst, to rest, to have a relationship with, with his wife, to produce children, is evil within, within of themselves. What they did was they called that concupiscence, a Latin word invented by Augustine, the chief heretic, spawn of Satan of all time, that invented all these things. He created this con concupiscence word, and it's three times stated in your King James Bibles. One of them, of course, being in that, Ro that Romans chapter 7 passage where he says all kinds of evil desires were stirred up. I think it's in, ver in verse 8 where he says all kinds of evil desires were stirred up by the law. Like he said, I was alive once without it, but when the, you know, when the law came and I violated it, well, then all those evil desires were stirred up. He says, but sin then taking advantage by the commandment produced all manner of, 
Well, it says evil desires in italics in most of the new versions. In King James Version, it says concupiscence. So the idea was under the moral depravity angle that came out of paganism, it came out of the rhetoric of paganism that, that Mr. Heretic himself came out of and wanted to cover up his own insatiable lust for the opposite sex, that his concupiscence was something he was born with. And every man, of course, is born with that. Of course, they even applied that to infants back then. And if an infant died without being baptized, they went straight to hell. And your old Mr. Kelvin Heretic, Burn Michael Servetus guy, he believed that too, which is absolutely appalling. But that's what these people, that's as far as these people will go with this. Not everybody in the old uh, reformers was willing to go that far with this. Uh, the, the Wesleyan side of things assigned a special grace for infants if they died uh, with not having Christian parents or before they were dedicated or baptized. Uh, they did believe in infant baptism, the, the Church of England at that time. But nevertheless, that's what they did to this. So they've, they've corrupted the idea of uh, desire, which can be translated either desire or lust. There's the same word. Depending on what the scripture is trying to depict, it can be the lust of the flesh, the desires, the passions and desires of the flesh, or I desire to come see you to further you along in the faith. Like uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7.7, 7, uh, Galatians 4.20, he used the word desire. It means a strong, longing desire, but it's not something evil. But the word can be translated both ways. So instead of just translating it desires, or just saying by those evil desires,